let's once again go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for another day to worship you. We are grateful for another day to sing your praises, to say your praises, to speak about you and, and hold your name up high. And Father, we know that uh, our world, uh, especially our country, uh, celebrates a, a holiday today um, that uh, is, is named in honor of one of your saints, one of your faithful followers, and yet our world uses it as a, a day of, uh, of revelry and a day to abandon you and a day to uh, escape into uh, the pleasures of this world rather than the uh, promises of Christ's kingdom. But we pray, Father, that in, in all of the celebrations and, and revelry that um, the citizens of our city and our, and our surrounding community would be safe, Father. We pray for um, just uh, good governance, good leadership, good uh, policing. Um, we pray, Father, for safe events and safe affairs and um, protection of, of life and, and property and uh, personal well-being. Father, we pray uh, that people would make smart decisions about their driving and the roads today. We pray this, Father, so that in your mercy that they might be given an opportunity also to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and find a peace that is so much more pervasive and so much deeper and so much more meaningful than parades and beer. Father, we pray that that maybe on days like today we would remember something of why they were originally important and why they were originally celebrated. That a man who was enslaved chose to preach the gospel to those who had once enslaved him. And that through the faithful service of Patrick, many came to know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. May we also be people who turn the other cheek when our enemies have struck us. And may we be faithful to hold high the name of Jesus Christ, whatever it costs us, that much might be made of him. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Turn in uh, your Bibles, if you would, to Revelation chapter 4, as we continue to make our way through the uh, book of Revelation. And if you're not sure, Revelation is the last book in your Bible. The large numbers are the chapter numbers, and there are Bibles in the pews, or not pews, but chairs, under the chairs in front of you. So if you need one, take that. If you don't have one, take it home. Revelation chapter 4. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peers, peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle 
in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Recently in Vietnam, uh, three Christians were released from jail after spending a week there. These sorts of arrests and detainments remain sadly common in communist Vietnam. In Nigeria, Muslim Fulani militants have killed more than 1,300 people since last year, mostly Christians. About 37,000 individuals, mostly women and children, are in a camp for internally displaced people's IDPs. From December 23rd to 25th, over 200 people, mainly Christians, were killed in what has been dubbed the Christmas Massacre. Another 170 were injured. Fulani militants are assumed responsible. Two Sundays ago, the Islamic militant group Boko Haram kidnapped more than 400 people from one of these IDP camps. Denmark recently passed laws to make it illegal to destroy religious texts after several public incidents of people burning the Quran. And while that might seem like a harmless law and only respectful of other people's faiths, consider Acts chapter 19. Do you remember the story in Acts chapter 19? If you don't, uh, the Apostle Paul was preaching the gospel in Ephesus. And a large number of people began following Jesus Christ. And in verses 18 through 19, we read that many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it to be 50,000 pieces of silver. So these new believers marked a break with their old way of life. With a denarius, which uh, was the silver coin generally being considered to be about a day's income at something like minimum wage, they burned $2.5 million in religious texts. And, and in doing so, they were effectively saying that despite their value in that society... The books were worthless in their hearts and minds. It was a powerful display of public repentance. But would that now be illegal in Denmark? In the Indian state of Manipur last year, hundreds of churches were destroyed, many individuals killed, some reportedly by stoning, being hacked to pieces, being burned alive. Women especially were brutalized and humiliated. But one pastor in Manipur saw it as a call to repentance for Christians. He didn't want to blame his fellow Christians for what had happened to them. But at the same time, he writes that it's time for Christians to look at themselves and repent. Why? From where he sits, too many Christians had supported efforts to undermine free elections. Too many of them call themselves Christians while opium plantations dot their hills. Too many of them supported a political party of nationalist leader uh, Narendra Modi. And while the party's policies have definitely suppressed Islam, the pastor points out that they aren't a friend of Christians. They have acted and will act to support Hinduism opposed to any faith whether that faith is Islam or Christianity. And so he writes, we are a Christian community and ought to live as such, but more often than not, we have chosen to ignore Jesus 
and rather make friends with the world. When we look around planet Earth today, we see many of the same struggles that the first century Christians faced. The same realities that surrounded the seven churches of the book of Revelation. There are jailings, there are deaths in some places, there are limitations on what can be said and done in Jesus' name in other places. And Christians remain tempted to find salvation in this world and compromise their faith. For those fighting the spiritual struggle to stand firm in their faith until the very last day, there may be days when life feels hopeless, overwhelming, and out of control. But it's a lie. Because God is on the throne. That's the message of Revelation 4. God is on the throne. And because God is on the throne, there is a spiritual exchange that takes place. And I'll flesh that out as we go and as we work through kind of the three beats of this passage. A solicitation, the situation, and the sanctification. The solicitation, the situation, and the sanctification. So a quick recap here. The Apostle John begins this book by explaining a vision or a series of visions, visions that he has one Sunday, the Lord's Day, he writes, as he was exiled on the island of Patmos off the coast of Turkey. He sees a vision of Jesus, powerful, filling the heavens, and he's first commanded to write down messages for seven churches on the mainland. The messages to those churches show that Jesus is keenly aware of what's going on in each city, in each place. He knows the ways that they have been faithful to him, and he praises them in their faithfulness. But he also knows where they've been struggling to be faithful, and he challenges them, he corrects them, he even rebukes them in their unfaithfulness. But in all of those cases, he encourages them to persevere. And he gives them a glimpse of the glorious rewards they will share with him when he returns. And chapter 4 picks up in the aftermath of those letters, right on the heels of those messages, and in particular, that message to the church in Laodicea that we talked about last week. The most, I think, challenging of all messages because it significantly lacked any signs of faithfulness on the part of the Christians in Laodicea. Jesus says he's ready to vomit them out of his mouth. They had so compromised their witness that they were nauseating. They were unpalatable to Jesus. They were nearly useless as Christians. But even there, Jesus reminds them that he disciplines the ones that he loves. And he holds out this promise for those who patiently wait for his return. But still, after that message, Christians might be longing for some good news. And that's when we turn the page to chapter 4. and We read, after this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Now, John hasn't seen anything new since chapter 1. But that changes very suddenly here. He's about to see a lot of things between here and the end of the book. And he sees here a vision of a door standing open. It's a way to enter the heavenly realm. And he hears a voice soliciting him to come up into heaven and to see what's next. John says it was the first voice, meaning it was the one that he heard back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10, where he wrote, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. And when John turned to look in the direction of that voice in chapter 1, that's when he captured this vision of Jesus. And so we have this movement. First, Jesus appears to John in a vision on Patmos. And now Jesus is inviting John in a vision into heaven itself. He's invited to learn what must take place after this. 
The things he will see are often things that take place in the future. But they're rooted in the past and in the present from John's perspective. So this solicitation to come to heaven and see what must take place after this, it really kicks off the rest of the book of Revelation, and and importantly for us, the rest of chapter 4. So John is taken into heaven, and he describes the scene there, or if you prefer, the situation. He begins at the end of verse 2, and he continues through the beginning of verse 8. Here's how he starts. Behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. This is the first time in the New Testament that there is a vision of the heavenly throne. It's been mentioned in Revelation uh, before this. The Holy Spirit is said to be before the throne in chapter 1. And in the last message to those seven churches, just a couple verses back, Jesus promised that if the church in Laodicea rekindles its faith and endures to the end, they will sit with him on his throne, even as he sits on his father's throne. And then John is whisked up into heaven to get a picture of that throne. I said this is the first time in the New Testament that we get a description of the heavenly throne, but it's not the first time in the Bible because glimpses of this scene are available in Exodus 24 when God confirms his covenant with the Israelites through Moses. We get a glimpse of it in Isaiah chapter 6, which Caitlin read from this morning when Isaiah is commissioned to be God's prophet. We get a glimpse of it in Ezekiel 1 when Ezekiel is commissioned to be God's prophet and in Ezekiel 10 when Ezekiel is given a vision of God's glory leaving the temple in Jerusalem. And then in Daniel chapter 10 when Daniel sees a vision of the world's empires supplanting each other in turn but them all being overshadowed by God's own kingdom. The vision's of Isaiah and Ezekiel especially, are very similar to John's vision of Revelation. And those Christians that John was writing to almost certainly were familiar with those passages from the Old Testament. That was the only Bible they probably had. One thing that is in common in those visions is that God is never seen directly in all of his glory. And the descriptions in Ezekiel and Exodus both mention precious gems in attempting to describe what was seen. It's probably not worth dwelling on the specific gems too much, like trying to find meaning or symbolism in an emerald or a a jasper or, or that sort of thing, because the words they used in the ancient world for these gems and how they categorized them is just different than the way we would do it. For example, Jasper, if you go and buy Jasper today, it's usually red. It can appear in a lot of different colors. But the ancients probably meant a green gem. And Jasper can be green, but but some think that they might have meant emeralds. So what they call Jasper, we would call an emerald. But then that would mean that the emerald in this passage is a different gem than what we call an emerald. So it just different categorizations of these precious stones. But that part is the same. These gems were precious. They were extraordinarily valuable. They were probably all translucent gems, so the so light would pass through them, refracting the light of God's glory in an infinite number of directions. Maybe, maybe the idea is that the gems sort of bent and refracted the light so that John could not see the glory of God directly. But what's for sure is that the heavenly throne and the ones seated on it are glorious beyond compare. The choicest and most precious stones are only a poor comparison for the sight that John beholds. There can only be one whom John is describing, and that is the one God. Around the throne, 
there's a rainbow, and that's a rainbow that's described like an emerald, which is hard to picture, right? Because emeralds are green, but rainbows, well, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of colors. But, but in these visions in the Bible, we're, we're left thinking that the writers are just straining to describe something absolutely glorious, absolutely amazing, absolutely terrifying, and they just don't have the words to do it justice. They are doing everything they can to describe it the best they can, but words are failing them. But the idea of a rainbow also appears in Ezekiel chapter 1. Ezekiel describes a figure somewhat resembling a man sitting on a throne, though that figure is ablaze with fire and glory, and below his waist, surrounding this fiery scene, Ezekiel writes, there was a brilliant light like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds after the rain. So what's the significance of a rainbow? Well, rainbows are obviously one of the most glorious and beautiful things in nature. I mean, it's rare if there's a rainbow in the sky that we don't stop at least for a second to take a look at it. And I can only imagine how true that would have been a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, before modern technology discovered how to reproduce almost any color you can imagine on any surface for pennies. Imagine going weeks or months, certainly days, seeing very little, if anything, that was purple or scarlet or deep blue. And then it rains and the rain passes and the sky is illuminated in an infinite number of wavelengths of visible light between ultraviolet and infrared. That God is enthroned with a rainbow certainly points to his absolutely magnificent glory. But Bible readers, and I hope you are a Bible reader, know that the rainbow is associated with God in his relationship with human beings. After God destroyed the land with a massive flood and creation came to rest once again and Noah and his family exited the ark, a rainbow hung in the sky. It was a promise that the God who had taken up the bow of war to deal with sin on earth had hung it up. The battle was over. And God promised to never again destroy the earth with a flood. It wasn't that the battle was unjust. It was just. But God would show mercy. The appearance of the bow around God's throne could be a symbol of that ongoing mercy. Things are very dark for his people. We get a glimpse of that in the first three chapters of Revelation. But there will be mercy. On the other hand, it could be a reminder that God still owns a weapon of war. Jesus has struck the fatal blow to sin and death by his death and his resurrection. But as the book of Revelation kind of unfolds, it's clear that there are still rebellions that need to be put down, rebellions that God in his mercy has let go on to give us time to turn back to him and to find the forgiveness that's offered in Jesus. So maybe the rainbow is a symbol that cuts two ways. It reminds us of God's great mercy, but it also reminds us of why his mercy is so great. His mercy is so great because he is perfectly capable of giving us frightening justice, what we deserve. But the situation in heaven is richer than that. Because around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their head. So the throne of God is surrounded by additional thrones. And those thrones are occupied by these elders who were dressed in white and wearing crowns. And Christians have debated who these elders are. On the one hand, they're in the throne room of God like angels. And on the other hand, they're decked out in the way 
that the Bible describes the faithful, clothed in white garments that have been made pure by the righteousness of Jesus Christ and, and crowns that symbolize that they have conquered by Christ's power this world of sin. Most likely, they're both. They are angels and they are humans. And I don't mean that humans become angels like some Looney Tunes cartoon. Don't get your theology from Saturday morning cartoons. But we see throughout the Bible that angels often represent God's people before God. So in, in chapters 2 and 3, each of the churches that Jesus has John write this message to, those messages actually go to an angel that is over that church, an angel that is representing them. So the letters are written to the angel, but they are for the church. They are for the Christians in those churches. Angels representing people before God's throne. And, and so that, that's John's vision. And it's, and it's highly symbolic. And then, I mean, the number of elders is two times 12. 12 being a number that often represents God's people since there were 12 tribes in Israel. There were 12 apostles of Jesus Christ. And there are a number of good theories about why Jesus uh, gives John a vision of 12 doubled. But I don't think it's all that important to dive into all those theories to get across the main point, which is that God's people, as represented by these sort of angelic beings, are surrounding the very throne of God. But the situation in God's throne room is richer than that. John continues that from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. Lightning and rumblings and thunder were signs of God's presence on Mount Sinai. Isaiah said in his vision, the whole ground shook at God's voice. Lightning appeared in Ezekiel's vision of the throne room. In fact, storminess, storms were often used to describe God's ways. Sometimes God is riding on storm clouds. As if these powerful, destructive forces that could wipe out a coastal habitation or an entire season of crops were just a tool for transportation for the God of the universe. He does as he pleases. And the most powerful forces in nature obey him. There's another vision of lights, torches here, which are the seven spirits of God, which we said back in chapter one is probably a a picturesque way of describing the Holy Spirit. He is given out to the seven churches, which then represent all of God's church. And throughout the New Testament, what does the Spirit do? He empowers the church to make Jesus known. And so the light, that's a fitting symbol for the Holy Spirit. And there's a sea of glass. Other Old Testament visions of God's throne room also include this description of a smooth, flat surface. Often it's described as sapphire. But again, we can't be too precise about these gems. Maybe John sees it the same way, though. Maybe he just describes it a little differently because the blue crystal of sapphire maybe appeared to John like a sea of glass. But it's another precious stone that's casually used as just a mere surface in God's throne room. And these details not only magnify God's glory, but let's be real, they, they add an element of terror, don't they? Because imagine if you were to take this scene and you were to try to turn this into a movie. If, if you wanted to do justice to this scene, it would require filming something that would make horror movies blush. I mean, I mean the power and the prestige of the Holy One are so intense that Isaiah cried out, Woe is me, for I am lost. 
And Ezekiel said, I threw my face down. And John likely would have responded the same way, except he had already done that in chapter 1. And he was comforted by Jesus himself. And John knows now that Jesus has welcomed him in. It's scary, but he's safe. And maybe that's the attitude that we should have toward God. If we are Christians, we should live and worship with these two truths stuck firmly in our minds. God is absolutely terrible, not as in a bad person, as in full of terror. terror. He is frightening. His power is so immense. But it's also true that we are absolutely safe because we have been welcomed into his presence by Jesus. We know that God can absolutely crush us, but he cradles us tenderly in his hand. But the situation is even richer than that. As John goes on, around the throne, on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight, and the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. No beast of any horror movie has ever graced the silver screen that can compare to these terrifying creatures. Ezekiel had almost an identical vision. There there are some differences, but since the visions are so symbolic, I don't think we should make much of those differences. The biggest difference, though, is that in Ezekiel's vision, each of these characters had four faces, but here each of them has just one. The various animal faces, though, probably suggest strength and power, just as humans and oxen and lions and eagles are powerful creatures in their own habitats. They have wings so they can move. They can get from place to place, and we would assume very quickly. And they are covered in eyes, which must have been terribly Creepy for John. But they told him something. Just as they told something to Ezekiel many years before. And just as they tell us something, they see. These creatures that stand continually before the very throne of God see in every direction at all times. And because they serve the one in the center It means God knows everything that is happening on earth. Importantly, though, John describes them as living creatures, a term that almost always refers to animals in the Bible. And so they may seem exalted. And and, and a pagan religion of John's day especially might have imagined a figure like that to actually be a god. But they're just creatures. They're just created things doing the will of the one who made them. So that's the situation, and it's intense. But take these different strands and pull them together for a second. The churches of the first century were forced to confront this reality. The world as they knew it was ruled by Caesar. Emperor Domitian was on the throne. And he was no friend of Christians, let alone God. He, in fact, demanded honor and worship. And the general hostility toward Christians likely made them feel weak and small and insignificant. Some had lost their lives. Some had lost their freedom. Some had lost their property. Many were challenged to compromise their faith to give in to relying on the forces of this world in order that through that they might care for themselves and care for their families. 
Things were so bad that in chapter 2, Jesus sympathized with the church in Pergamum. He said, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. But while the world looks one way, the reality is far different. Far above the plane of this earth where no eye can see, a different truth is firmly fixed. Not Caesar, but God is on the throne. God is on the throne. And what's more, he sees everything. Just as Jesus wrote to each church and and told them what he knows, now we see a clearer picture of how the God who, as the Apostle Paul wrote, dwells in unapproachable light, is aware of everything that happens here on earth. He knows every injustice committed against his people, every pain of his people, every broken heart of his people, every tear of his people. He knows And he is on the throne. Whatever we endure in this life, God knows and God is on the throne. It isn't Joe Biden. It isn't Donald Trump. It isn't Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations. It It isn't even Indian President Narendra Modi. It isn't the Vietnamese Communist Party head, uh, Nguyen Phu Trong. It isn't Abu Umamara of Bogo Haram. God is on the throne. And if God is in control, and if God knows what's going on, then Christians of all people have hope. We have confident hope. As Paul writes in Romans 5, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God is on the throne. God is in control. Hold on to that truth. This world will tell you It's not that, it's someone else, it's something else, and you must give allegiance to that. You must give allegiance to him. You must honor her, but God is on the throne. That fact that God is in control leads to another truth. We go back to those four strange creatures John says, day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Isaiah heard the seraphim in God's throne room cry out the same thing, holy, holy, holy. So these powerful, exalted beings do nothing but ascribe Holiness to God. They sanctify him. That's the Lord's prayer, isn't it? Hallowed be thy name. Another translation would be, may your name be sanctified. Or we can put that a little more simply. May your reputation and character, O God, be regarded as holy. John receives a solicitation into the throne room of heaven, and after describing the situation up there, he tells us about this eternal sanctification, this eternal day and night announcement of God's essential holiness. It's often mentioned that holy is the only description of God that gets a threefold repetition. He is merciful, He is loving. He is just. He is powerful. But he is holy, holy, holy. If there is one quality of God that stands above all the others, it is that he is holy. To be holy means to be set apart. God 
is entirely set apart. He is in a class by himself. Nothing compares to him. There is God, and then there is everything else. And then the elders, these angels who represent God's people, they take their turn. And every time they hear the four creatures say, holy, 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 they fall down before God and they cast their crowns at his feet. Though God's people will one day rule alongside him, all of that rule is derivative. We will only have it because God allows us a measure of authority, but the ultimate authority is his. And in John's vision, we recognize it by symbolically giving that authority back to God. And as they do so, they say, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Last fall, we looked at the beginning of the book of Genesis, and, and what we really have here in Revelation 4 is a restoration of Genesis 1 and 2 and a reversal of Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, these human beings were created in God's image and given rule and authority over the earth and over all of the living existence chose to ignore God's ultimate rule. They chose to ignore God's authority. We tried to usurp God to overthrow him. We rebelled against him. And we believed a lie that God was not good, that God was selfish in his uniqueness and his holiness. And so we tried to make ourselves kings and queens in God's place. But now in the throne room of God, these angels who are representing God's people acknowledge that God alone is the rightful ruler. He alone is on the throne. He created everything. And so he is the rightful ruler. He's the rightful owner. He is the rightful master. And even now, those of us who belong to Christ, though we rebelled, though we were under a death sentence, a spiritual death sentence, we have been redeemed, we have been restored, we have been forgiven through Christ's sacrifice, we have peace with God, and we can begin to see our hearts transformed, even restored to their created purpose. We can acknowledge in truth that we are not the masters of our destinies. But God is on the throne. He made everything. And he made us. He willed it, and it was so. And so we belong to him. We recognize that he alone is king. He alone is on the throne. He alone created the universe. And he alone is worthy of our worship. Not me. Not you. Not Caesar. God. Our hope, rooted in God, rooted in God alone being on the highest throne, leads us to worship. And each day our worship is being molded by the Spirit to be more faithful and more pure. Until on that last day when the last ounce of sin that separated us from God is destroyed forever. Not just its guilt, but its very reality, its very existence. On that day, those of us who conquer, who hold firm till the end, will have our worship perfected as we cast our crowns on that glassy sea. And so we see that in 
Revelation 4, there is this sort of spiritual exchange that's taking place. As we are given hope and confidence by God's presence on the throne, and that is placed into our hearts, our hearts then explode outward with praise and worship for his gloriousness, his majesty, his power, and his holiness. Our confidence in Christ and the Father enthroned in heaven, poured into our hearts, explodes outward from our hearts in our worship. Christian, God is on the throne. Whatever you have been dealing with, whatever our people have been dealing with, whether they be here in Cleveland or whether they are in Vietnam or northern Nigeria or whether they are in northeastern India or wherever they may be, he knows. And we have hope. And because we have hope, he is worthy of our worship. Let's pray. Oh God, who is enthroned so far above us, we give you our praise. We give you our worship. We recognize that you are God. You are sovereign. You are king. You deserve all good blessings. You deserve all honor. You deserve us to lay down our all in humble recognition that it already is yours. Father, pour out in our hearts the confident hope that does not disappoint us. That you are enthroned. And because you are enthroned, and because you know, we need not fear anything. We need not be concerned about any movement of this world. And though nations and kings and political parties and sadly friends and even family members may turn against us, may tell us of a throne that we need to bow down to, steal our hearts by your Spirit to stand firm in our faith to the last day that you are on the throne. In you we hope. In you we have confidence. And in this truth we pour out our worship to you. May it be so in our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's sing holy Holy, holy.